Okay. Welcome everyone to the EEA Education Series SIG. Um, today we have the CTO of SCALE who will be presenting Unrolling Rollups. Um, we have Constantine Placco. Um, so Constantine, I will turn it over to you and thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I was really excited to come to this seminar and be able to broadcast from my bedroom. I'm sure that you guys are probably also, many of you are in your bedrooms. So please enjoy this webinar. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, roll-ups. It's, it's a pretty hot topic and uh, many people asking questions what our roll-ups are. So I have a presentation which is kind of simple and uh, provides enough information for you to be able to talk about roll-ups, for instance, at the party or somewhere else. Okay, let's start. So, as I said, I am the CTO of SCALE. Uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about SCALE and myself. So, I am the CTO. SCALE Network is an Internet of Elastic ETH compatible blockchains, which are connected to the ETH mainnet. So, we are releasing our network in the second quarter of 2020, and anything you can do on AWS, you'll be able to do on SCALE. Now let's talk about rollups. So I'm going to discuss how we at scale got interested in rollups, then different types and flavors of rollups. It turns out there are three of them. And then finally talk a little bit more about BLS rollups. These are the rollups that we are working on at scale. First, let's just start with some generic questions. And one interesting thought is how will the world look like in 2023, pretty much three years from now. So the way we see this at scale is that three years from now, we'll have many, many blockchains. All of them will be interacting with each other. All of them will be ETH compatible and they will use ETH mainnet as a foundation, as a security foundation. So all of the tokens will live on ETH mainnet while tokens will be able to jump from TH mainnet to all of those blockchains back and forth. So that, that's, the no, that's the world in th three years from now as we see it. So as I said, we see the world as an internet of ETH compatible blockchains, and then these blockchains will run DeFi, they will run decentralized Uber, decentralized Facebook, Google, you name it. So in 2023, ETH will turn from a project into an ecosystem of compatible projects, very much like the web of today. So what we can predict is that three years from now, there will be lots of ETH compatible projects, chains, and it will look like this. It's like a British parliament. So there will be lots of cooperation, competition, but that's all going to be great for ETH. What we all need though, all projects need a well-functioning ETH mainnet, right? And we also need this at scale. The current ETH mainnet was a great start in 2015, but as many people know, nowadays it kind of has a low throughput. It has long finalization time, which means that you submit a transaction and you wait a long time until you're sure the transaction is actually completed. And it's also unreliable. You never know if a transaction will succeed. Sometimes you send the transaction and it succeeds. Sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes it gets rejected, too little guess, whatever. So a big problem is that the network is not really reliable. Now, another problem with ETH mainnet is that it's extremely prone to front running and manipulation. If you submit a transaction, it's unclear. Other people see this transaction, miners see this transaction, so they can censor it, they can manipulate it, they can reorder transactions, they can front run your transactions. And all of these things are happening on, on mainnet now. In fact, many people are making literally millions of dollars doing all kinds of front running manipulation, reordering, all kinds of things like that. So it's a big problem, especially for DeFi. And then recent events, just last month we had this event. Many people know about this event with MakerDAO that got crashed and other projects. And these events have shown that the mainnet has problems running DeFi. At critical moments, it's not responsive. It doesn't accept transactions. It does accept transactions from wrong people that steal money, all kinds of things. So we understand now that the mainnet needs to be improved. 
So at scale, as at many other projects, we are interested in solutions that improve the mainnet because many of our things are running on the mainnet. The problem is though, that the mainnet architecture is almost impossible to modify because it's a group, uh, it's a community of many people, different people have different opinions and even a small change can take huge time to get implemented or get rejected. As for instance, Proc POW, many of you guys know the story of Proc POW, that was a feature which first was actually accepted, then rejected. And the entire discussion about this feature shows that the main net is really hard to modify. Now, since the main net is hard to modify, it makes sense to explore add-on solutions that improve the main net without touching it. So again, it's a very important thing. You know, if we could easily modify the main net and implement new features, you may not need to look for this add-on solutions. But since it's very hard to do it, we can't really change the thing. We're essentially trying to add something else to make it better. So then the question is, what do we need? We are all the customers of the main net, right? And what do customers want? Well, it turns out to be a complex question. But customers want usability, ease of use, security, transactions throughput, it should be able to process lots and lots of transactions per second, but also fast finalization, meaning that the time to confirm a transaction should be short. Decentralization is important. You should be running not on a single computer, but on multiple decentralized parties. And finally, 45 for decentralized finance manipulation resistance is all, all important because of all things like uh, front running, reordering, censoring, all of the things I told you guys about. <clears throat> so another question is what customers don't want? Well, customers don't want to work to protect their security like monitor their network, submit complaints, etc. So every time you ask the customer to fight for her security, she's like, what? So it's not really something that consumers expect, that they, they not expect that they have to fight for their security. And then also customers don't want to wait to access funds. If your solution freezes funds for hours or days, people usually don't like it. People are used to going to their web UI of their bank and being able to transfer funds fast. So then there's a, another interesting thing, the industry se sectors. There are multiple industry sectors and they have different requirements. Basically we have payments, games, DeFi and Web3. And Web3 is all kinds of things like decentralized Uber, decentralized Facebook, centralized Google. So those are the five, four primary drivers today for, for acceptance of blockchain. And they have different requirements. In particular payments, simple payments and simple money transfers don't require smart contracts. All other guys do. Now for payments, the, the requirements are uh, the following. Usability is critically important because you know, consumers like to have apps that transfer money easily. Security is important, but actually for micropayments, consumers are fine if, if they lose you know, a, a penny or two pennies at, at some point. So security important, but not so critical in some cases. Transaction throughput is critical because there are just many consumers in this world and many people buy many cups of coffee. Fast finalization is important sometimes. If you buy coffee, fast finalization is important. You don't want to wait like a minute at Starbucks until your transaction is processed. On the other hand, if you're sending money to a country far, far away, okay, you can wait a day. So fast finalization is important in some cases, not important in other. Decentralization is important. You don't want a single party to control your payments. And then manipulation, re manipulation resistance is actually nice to have because you don't really care if someone reorders your transaction or if someone sends your transaction a little, a little later. And if you get censored out, you'll just resubmit the transaction. So manipulation resistance is not so critical for payments as it, crit is, it is critical for DeFi. Now for games, usability is critical. Uh, this, those people are just consumers, many of them children. Security is important, but not critical because you know if your game gets hacked, well, it's not so bad as if your bank account gets hacked, right? Transactions throughput is critical. People like playing fast games because of the same reason fast finalization is critical. 
Decentralization is important, but not so critical. You know, you'll probably play a game even if it's not so decentralized, maybe like on the 10 servers, not on the thousand servers. And then manipulation resistance is again nice to have because games are not financial applications. Now, DeFi. DeFi is basically trying to take Wall Street and put it on blockchain. So everything which is true on Wall Street is the same for DeFi. Usability for DeFi is important, but not critical. Many Wall Street traders, you know, use very complex and hard to use software, but they use it because it helps them to make profit. So usability is important, not critical. But then security, transaction throughput, file finalization, decentralization and manipulation resistance are critical just compared to Wall Street, right? And Wall Street people trade really fast and they expect, expect the trading platform to be really fair. And manipulation resistance is kind of a pain point currently because the current DeFi platforms have so many ways to manipulate. Sometimes I see that I think, you know, why, do, why am I on the bright side? Maybe I should go to the dark side because I just see so many ways to to manipulate DeFi and, and make money. Now, Web3, things like decentralized Uber, decentralized Facebook, well, usability is critical, clearly. Security is important, you know, if someone uh, hacks your Facebook page, okay, it's not your bank account. Transaction throughput is critical, otherwise you won't be able to upload so many photos. Pass finalization is critical. Decentralization is important, although it, it probably shouldn't be as decentralized as, as a financial system. And then manipulation resistance, as with games, is nice to have. So the point I'm making is that different sectors of the economy, of the blockchain economy, may have different requirements, and there is really no silver bullet. Uh, and in general, there is a very general law of complex systems, which says that complex systems are all about trade-offs. You know, you improve security, usability goes down, you improve speed, decentralization goes down. So really there's no magic bullet and you have just to make the right trade-offs. And mathematics simply has its limits. When people say they invented some magic math, well, mathematics existed like for thousand years and there's very little happening in mathematics on, on a single year. So we have some limits that, we, that mathematics and computer science imposes on us, but within these limits, we have to make the right decision and the wisdom is in actually making the right trade-offs. Plasma was supposed to be a perfect solution, but after several years of research, they don't really have a workable and secure version. And I think what happened with Plasma is just tried to be the silver bullet. And they just found out that it's impossible to do. So now people kind of moved from Plasma to Rollups and Rollups is much more, more like a real, realistic solution. So compared to Plasma, Rollups are more of a niche and you know, down to earth solution. So let's, let's dive into Rollups now. What are Rollups? Well, let's start with uh, having a picture of what ETH mainnet is. So ETH mainnet has pretty much three important pieces. First of all, transactions. So these transactions are in white here and transactions are usually assembled to blocks. So people send transactions, they're added to blocks and blocks are attached to the blockchain, right? Then this uh, Pacman here is Ethereum virtual machine, smart contracts, uh, uh, this thing actually eats one tra transaction at a time and does something. And it has this book. The book is uh, EVM storage or EVM state. That's where all of the accounts are stored. That's where it says Alice has $1,000 and Bob has $1 million. And that's when uh, this Pacman eats a transaction, it can transfer money, which means that it adds five dollars to the account of Alice and subtracts five dollars from the account of, Eli of Bob and all of this happens in this book. So really blockchain are these three important ingredients, EVM, blockchain itself, and then the st storage or the state storage as, as people call it. Now the idea of, of rollups is actually trivial. The idea is that okay let's let's keep the transactions on the blockchain on the main net but let's remove the EVM and potentially the state storage from the mainnet and just leave the transactions on, on the mainnet. And then let's create this guy. The guy is named operator. So the guy will actually run this uh, Ethereum virtual machine and the state storage. And uh, But the guy will still post 
as a double check post the transactions to the mainnet so if you want to check the guy later you can take these transactions and execute them against the virtual machine and see if you get the same result the idea is that transactions fully deterministically determine how much money you have if it's known where did you start how much money you had at the start and which transactions you had very much similar like in your bank account if you know how much money you have at the start of july and you know all of the transactions okay you know how much money you uh, have at the end of july this is something which is called reconciliation of books right in accounting but by using the same reconciliation of books on blockchain if the guy becomes bad the, if the operator becomes bad if since you know all the transactions you can find out who has what how much money so roll up a definition roll up of a roll up it can be defined as a solution where transactions are stored on chain but evm processing and state storage may be off chain and the idea is that since in this case the blockchain the mainnet does little less things it can work faster because you're offloading some stuff okay so so then it's important to import, understand one point about Ethereum. There were, this coming, there's a, a burning fork coming sometime in the summer of 2020. And this burning fork will reduce the per byte gas fees for transaction publishing. So you'll actually be able to shovel more transactions on the mainnet. And in fact, this particular fork, this reduction of the gas price was actually made it's just to satisfy requirements for rollups. So we can say, okay, maybe it's a little political, maybe it's not political, but in any case, you know, it will be easier to publish more data on the blockchain as transactions, and therefore rollups will be will work better. Now there are three flavors: optimistic rollups, zk rollups, and BLS rollups, something that we do at scale. And I'm going to cover all three and then talk to you a little more about our rollups. So optimistic rollups are really the simplest, uh, very simple to explain, <laughs> since they actually include almost no technology. Essentially, what the operator does, the operator runs a single node ETH network, literally downloads an ETH node software and runs it. And instead of ETH mainnet, you run on this single guy. So, but then what the guy does, so the guy accepts transaction, runs his single node network, but then from time to then the guy first publishes all of the transactions on the mainnet as we discussed as we just discussed for the sake of history so all of the transactions are published but then also as far as the evm state is concerned as far as, far as this book is concerned at some points in time the guy takes a mathematical object which is called the miracle root of state basically some mathematical number and publishes this on, on the blockchain. And the property of this number is that this number, if you even change one bit in this book, the number will be different. So the number depends on all of the characters in the book. And then there is the police guy. The police guy sees all of the transactions on the mainnet, basically re-executes them and checks uh, the Merkle roots that they're correct. And then the police guy, the cop, sees the Merkle root is correct incorrect it means that the operator is, is, a cheat, is a cheating or his software is corrupt but in whatever case the cup will complain uh, and there's a complaint resolution procedure which can take hours or days to resolve and then this operator is deemed to be a bad guy the chain is reverted to the previous checkpoint and another operator is uh, is chosen so basically this entire idea is that the guy runs it but the right the run publishes checkpoints and the cops anyone could be a cop the user could be a cop the cops check these checkpoints at the merkle roots and the, if the merkle roots are not okay then there's they file a complaint and ultimately fire the operator so this thing what you see that what it protects against is it protects against operator mis-executing things but it doesn't protect for instance against the operator front running reshuffling transactions censoring transactions so it actually uh, puts very short very uh, no, not non tough limits on the operator so operator periodically publishes multiple routes as i said on the evm state with the main net cops re-execute transactions and if the state does not match complain the complaint resolution procedure can take hours or days that's really how optimistic rollup works 
And so there are several things about to say about optimistic rollups. So they are an interesting solution, but first they are definitely centralized, but because there's a single operator, then they are, as I mentioned, manipulation prone because front running, censoring, reordering, all of the things uh, actually stay. Uh, they are user unfriendly because uh, you need to, when you have this complaint resolution procedure, if you want to pull money out of your rollup, you'll have to wait until the complaint resolution procedure finishes, which means that you'll have a long time to wait until your money comes. And then you have to watch it until you, uh, for your security because either you have to be a cop or someone else has to be a cop and uh, someone else needs to, you need to make sure that this cop exists. So because of this thing, we are not really optimistic about optimistic rollups, but I think it's still in some cases, they can be used in particular in games where you know the requirements for security are not so strong so they may actually be useful in games i think now there's another flavor which is called zk rollups and they are almost like the merkle rollups but on the other hand very different so for zk rollups uh, you have pretty much the same structure people submit transactions to the operator operator publishes them on the main net and then from time to time publishes the thing which is called merkle rule but in addition to this it publishes this very interesting mathematical object which is called zk proof and it's really like what mathematics provided to us last 10 years you know it's an invention of the last 10 years and zk proofs actually proof actually magically proves that the Merkle root is correct. So you and you can do this in solidity on chain. So somehow magically, when this guy posts this Merkle root plus the zk proof, the solidity code, the smart contract on the mainnet can take the zk proof and say yes, that's the correct Merkle root. So the guy can cheat on the Merkle root. Now how this happens? So zk proof is a mathematical object that proves that the Merkle root of the new state has been computed correctly based on the raw old root and transactions on chain. ZK proofs take lots of power to compute and can be verified in solidity really fast. So the funny thing about them, you take hours and days to compute them, but if you want to verify the proof, you can just do it in solidity so EVM can verify them. So they can be basically used to a fluid computation from the mainnet because instead of computing the Merkle root itself, the mainnet will actually trust the ZK proof. Now, ZK rollups are definitely way, way more advanced than optimistic rollups. And first of all, they are user friendly because they are not, there's no procedure for user to wait until the complaint complete. There's no complaint, actually. Uh, and then the users don't have to watch out for their security. All of the things are done by ZK proofs. So all of these problems of the optimistic rollup are solved totally by ZK proofs. On the other hand, you know, there is still some weaknesses. So ZK rollups are manipulation prone. The people, the operator can still order, reorder transactions, front run, uh, censor out. And then the big problem with ZK rollups is they finalize slowly, sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, hours, and sometimes days. The problem is that the technology, the ZK proofs are still an early technology and they are still slow. And in some cases, they are so slow that it takes days for you to compute this ZK proof. So that's the major issue about the most important issue about ZK rollups. The technology is great, but it's a little early. I don't know how fast it's gonna pre pre get uh, uh, improved, uh, but at this point, we looked into this technology really hard at, at scale and really wanted to use it and made the conclusion sadly that we can't use it in 2020. Maybe we will see, we change our mind in 2021. So another thing about ZK rollups, it's applicable only to money transfers and very simple contracts because ZK proofs get really, really complex to create for, for complex contracts. So you can't really run generic EVM contracts. Uh, so because of that, you can't really run a sophisticated exchange using ZK rollups. But if you want a money transfer or very simple exchange, you can do it. But for an exchange, you have another problem with ZK rollup manipulation and the fact that they finalize slowly. So I think realistically, ZK rollups are going to be great for money transfers. Performance is still slow. 
don't seem to be a realistic solution for the next 12 months. We hope this changes and we actually would like to use them at scale. And finally, billions roll ups. That's the thing that we kind of created at scale starting when we actually initially wanted to do something like ZK roll ups. We found out they were slow. And then we wanted to say, okay, what can we do now? What can we do in 2020? And so it's a practical solution based on helping mainnet use, uh, and using a different crypto object called aggregated signatures. I'm going to talk about this in, in, in a couple of slides. And in this particular case, what's interesting, the operational role is limited since the, we actually keep the state on the mainnet. So that's how BLS rollups look like. Uh, uh, we actually, first of all, we keep the EVM and, and the book on the main net. The operator doesn't execute e smart contracts or read the state. All of this stuff is on the main net. And then we replace the operator with a blockchain. So it's our scale chain. So instead of a single guy, it's actually a set of smart contracts running on, on a scale chain. And then another interesting thing that we do. Uh, we shrink transactions, and that's the key thing. You see on this picture that transactions, uh, when they go to the operator, are larger and they get shrinked by the operator. So because the operator can shrink transactions, and I explain to you in a moment how it gets shrinked, the operator can push more transactions to the main net and it increases the speed. And then the last thing which is interesting, it's something which is called threshold encryption. It's a technology also which like last like probably like last 15 years in mathematics. It allows us to encrypt transactions when they are submitted to the operator. So the operator only sees the encrypted transactions and transactions are decrypted only after the operator commits them to, the, to its chain. So by this time, it's too late to do front running on manipulation. So it's basically a very simple solution, but the mess is interesting. So transactions are encrypted. It's clear that if something is encrypted, it's hard to manipulate because you don't really know what is, is inside of it. Okay, so the main idea, as I told you guys, the main idea behind our BLS rollup is to shrink transactions. So a typical ETH transaction is like 100 plus bytes. Out of this 100 plus bytes, uh, 64 bytes is something which is called a CDSA signature. It's your signature as a user. You sign, you say, that's my transaction. That's how you authenticate yourself. Otherwise, everyone will be able to use your money. And then the 20 bytes is the destination, where do you send your money? So we shrink the things dramatically. First of all, for the destination and for the source, we use just four byte indexes. We just enumerate like users, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and use up to four bytes. And then for the amount, we will also use only four bytes, which makes that our amounts can be a little rough because they are, you know, uh, essentially integer numbers, but it's, it's not so important. So we actually shrink the transaction to 12 bytes, but the key is that we totally remove the CDSA signature. And the question is, how can we totally remove a CDSA signature? Well, what we do with the signatures, we destroy them, but we, before destruction, we glue them together in a very interesting mathematical object, which is called aggregated signature. And it turns out this one single aggregated signature is equivalent to many, many signatures, initial signatures. So if we have a roll-up block of a thousand transactions, each of them has a signature. We glue this many, many 1,000 signatures into one single tiny signature, and somehow magically it actually is still secure. So that's, uh, I think it was invented about 15 years ago at Stanford, this BLA signature things. And that's how it works. Many, many, many people sign, maybe N people. Now everyone has a signature. This signature is now takes lots of space. But now this algorithm that glues them together and creates this very simple number, essentially, like file. And this signature, the small signature, which could be like 60 bytes, or the, this signature actually still in, somehow inside of it contains of all of others. So the security stays the same. So we're using this bill as aggregated signatures. We aggregate many signatures into one. And in our case, this the document that is signed is a roll-up block that the operator is creating. So it's very straightforward. And when we do this, we, we actually, just after doing this, we immediately get a speed up of about four times. So we get about 50 transactions per second for your C20 tokens and 90 transactions per second for NFT. 
compared to the current like 13 transactions per second for a C20, so essentially we spend four times less gas for a C20 transactions. And what's interesting, it's uh, without uh, any change to the security. In this case, the security stays, the operator cannot influence anything except reordering, reordering transactions, but the, the operator can change transactions. So you actually get four times the throughput. And the second idea, now the second idea that now we need to decrease the gas spent per transaction even more. And we looked at this and we saw that the most of the gas is after we shrink transactions, most of the gas is spent on saving state. Because when Alice sends money to Bob, if uh, Alice now has $5 and Bob now has $7, this amount, the balance needs to be updated in the books. So we have to have at least two writes in the Ethereum virtual machine and the writes are expensive. So what basically this kind of stage two of our rollup is that instead of writing into expensive EVM state, actually it turns out EVM has a different storage, which is called logs, which is much cheaper. And you write this amounts of how much Alice has and how much Bob has uh, in logs. Now this amount still stay on the mainnet, which is great because users can read it from the mainnet, but they become much cheaper. So, but then the problem is, as I said, uh, we can't change EVM. EVM can write logs, but for whatever reason, important reason, can't read logs. So we can't read this from smart contracts. And the way we, we actually fix this, we use our, our, our chain, scale chain, to, uh, to read the transactions, to help EVM read transactions. So essentially, the operator, when the operator submits the rollup block, it also reads from the mainnet what are the initial balances of all of the users in this block and also submits. So it's a trick, basically a hug that we use and we have to use this hack because we can't modify the mainnet. That's the best we can do. So if we do this, this gives us up to 900 ERC-20 transfers per second. And that's it. You, at this point, when I'm now publishing state into logs, we shrink transactions, we can't really do much more. So it's an interesting solution. You know, it's user-friendly because the state is actually on the mainnet. So at any time you can find how much money you have by reading the mainnet. It is manipulation resistant. I explained how by using this threshold encryption thing. Uh, the state is kept on the mainnet, but then there's, there are drawbacks so because similar to ZK rollups, we can also only do transfers or maybe simple smart contracts. So no EVM. So really applicability of this for the most part is money transfers. You can read more about BLS rollups, all of the calculations on our blog. You can it's scale that network blog introducing BLS rollup. You can easily Google it, just Google for BLS rollups. You can also find it on my Twitter. And so we are working on a, to release a prototype for this thing in the summer of 2020. Our network is going to be released in the second quarter of this year. So rollups are going to be released maybe like three months after. But finally, again, I want to reiterate, I hope I provided to you guys a nice kind of overview of rollups. So you can, if you want to get more information about them, you can go and read blogs, you know, videos and whatever. But it was a nice overview. Uh, having said everything, you know, rollups, in my view, is a niche feature. It's, it's a feature, it's not a product. You know, it's a great thing, but I don't think it qualifies as as something which is, will dramatically change blockchain. And I think really the only thing which can change blockchain is blockchain itself. The future will have all kinds of blockchains, fast and slow, secure and less secure, and they will probably all, all be ETH compatible and will all interact with each other. So that's the mainstream and rollups are a little bit of a kind of a side feature, but still they are useful, applicable mostly to transfers in my view, not smart contracts, not definitely not DeFi because ability to manipulate, but still useful in some cases also maybe in games. Okay, guys, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer your questions for, and also thanks to scale investors for investing in us. Thank you, Constantine. Um, that was a great presentation. We, it looks like we have two questions for you. And if anybody else has questions, go ahead and put, write your questions in the question bar. We'll read those aloud. Um, the first question we have is, if rollups can move back in time to restore, how will this impact finality and how long until no rollup will happen? Yeah, that's actually a great, great question. That's another problem that, 
how do you move back in time? So basically, the idea is that this guy, the roll-up operator, he executes the this one node EVM for you. And then you find out the guy was wrong. Um, then the, there's a complaint, it's proven that the guy is wrong, whatever. Now you say, okay, I fired this guy and I know I want, want another guy, but someone has had to keep, uh, to keep a backup of, of the state for the previous, previous checkpoint. So these cops, they have to have the state and then they have to somehow roll back. And this entire procedure is frankly no one actually ever specified. I've never read the, I mean, it, the explanations at this point, at least for optimistic rollups, don't go so deep. And I think, you know, there is a, several hard things to do with optimistic rollups. One thing is that the notion of a cup, you know, the cups are paid only when they find problems. And it's arguably a hard way to keep, to pay to cops. Like, let's say you are in Palo Alto, you know, in California, Palo Alto is a like, good city, no crime, pretty much, right? So if you were, if you would pay to cops in Palo Alto for each, you know, murderer found or like caught, they wouldn't be just be able to make any money. So arguably an economic model of paying cops pure found guy, is not really great because if situation is good, then what's gonna happen is that the cops will leave. And then you literally can face the situation when there's only one cup because there's no economic sense for the second one. Well, this one cup can actually become the bad guy. So that's why this entire crypto economic procedure with optimistic rollups is still un really undefined and frankly not no one knows you know we, it, it hasn't been released yet but that's a really great question because this procedure i think it's really where you know the essence comes thank you um we have one more question um can you tell us more about bls what bls stands for and what what's your relationship with it yeah, so it's a great idea. First of all, we at scale kind of we uh, kind of behaving like a startup. So we don't really invent any algorithms, any mathematics. We think that a startup can't really do math because fundamental science takes like hundreds of years. So what we try to do at scale, we just compile academic papers and we try to use like best academic academic algorithms coming from different universities, research labs, and, and things like that. So BLS was actually invented. Uh, uh, by a professor at Stanford, Dan Bonet, and two of his PhD students, Lin and Shaham. And actually, at the top, I actually was working at a startup which was founded with Professor Bonet, so I know him well. Um, so, so he 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 actually invented this BLS signature. This really cool, cool signatures that you can glue, and it's like many big things glue into one small thing, but uh, they are still. Uh, Kind of having keeping the same security, but what's interesting that about the thing is that the mathematics that is based on it's so-called wild pairing. Well, there was a guy in France. His name was and Andre Weil, and he was trying to avoid draft, not to go I think into World War II. So French, I think he, they caught him and they put him in jail, and he was like in jail for I think, several years, and he had absolutely nothing to do. So he was, while he was had absolutely nothing to do, he had just a piece of paper and a pen, and he invented the thing which was like totally useless thing, which is called while pairing some abstract object in some abstract group theory. Well, you know that that's what happens with mathematics. That 50 years later, cryptographers use this uh, thing which was totally seemed totally useless to the guy for for something really real for these threshold signatures and aggregated signatures. And aggregated signatures and threshold signatures, you know, they invented, were invented by then Bonet around 2000, but no one really used them. And I think they really got used when uh, blockchain appeared and they were used in multi-sig wallets. And now ETH2 is going to use also them uh, in uh, uh, aggregated signatures in their consensus algorithm. And we at scale also use them in our consensus in many, many places. They're super great and they can, you can they do many, many things based on them. All right, thank you. Um, we have another question. If the operator itself is a side chain, how much latency does processing by operator add to the overall transaction time? 
So that's a great question. So, you know, in any case, that, that's a, a really great question because this entire procedure in any case will have latency because the operator has to process and then, as you've seen, it has to be posted on the mainnet and finalized on the mainnet. So, so in some sense, this rollups actually have more latency than just transactions on the mainnet because it goes through the operator first and then it goes to the mainnet. And then there are also all of these like complaints. So the latency is not the best, uh, the, 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 uh, the strong point of rollups, I think. In our case, at scale, we have user proof of stake algorithm, which has about, uh, what, several second latency. So it will probably add a couple of seconds of latency. So the latency we're going to have anyway, because we're going to post the transactions on the, on the main net. So we'll have like, uh, nowadays, how, how long do you have to wait? Probably like several minutes. You know, it keeps longer and longer, you know, the number of blocks you have to wait until your financial transaction is secure. So in any case, it's it's a slow thing, and that's that's why I, I, it's an important thing to realize about rollups. They are not a silver bullet because necessarily it's kind of an add-on to something that can be changed. So as ever, ever always in engineering, well, you do whatever you can do best, but uh, you can't really change things. So solutions like that are always have this problem. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, is plasma dead? I think uh, I think uh, there is a deep mathematical reason why plasma is dead. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, the idea of plasma was that you would do things uh, somewhere else, and you would then somehow magically, when bad things happen, you magically take all of the history of happening, what was happening somewhere else, and somehow bring this to the mainnet and the mainnet magic magically would judge and resolve this so the, that was the idea that uh, you do things like super fast outside of the mainnet but then there's a complaint something bad happens now well you use this slow and unreliable mainnet to resolve the problem in this your fast 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 thing so it does seem to be unachievable mathematically just from the generic point it's too good from the theory of complex systems so it can be proven that uh, plasma cannot run smart contracts and i think vitalik had uh, a write up about this or he mentioned this somewhere smart plasma can't run smart contracts besides smart contracts there are different version of plasma but even the limited ones turned out to be uh, too hard and uh, you know usually in mathematics when people try something for several years it, it's 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 not easy it may, means it's hard and it's in complex systems you know usually basically things are if you if you think something is too good to be true and then you try it and it's not working it's not really a proof that it's 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 dead but you know you maybe it's not dead but then you say okay maybe i'll spend another 20 years trying to research this so People moved to other things. Maybe, maybe there's a like totally genius way to fix it, but people moved to other things, to roll-ups in particular. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more guys. questions. Um, if any any of the attendees want to ask any questions, please uh, drop a question in the question bar at this time. Um, Constantine, if you can, um, if you will go ahead and share your the website and yes, your absolutely. twitter um in the chat so the attendees can can follow um we would love yes. that as well totally guys and thank you very much for inviting me it's really great you know i was so surprised that i got invited i really like e ea and uh, i think it's a great organization I, I truly believe in the power of ethereum and enterprise it, it definitely can i think replace oracle and do many things so thank you for the invitation you can if you have more questions or just want to chat with me you can just send me a message on twitter i'm on twitter almost all the time so i'll be really happy to chat with you and i'll post my twitter handle thank you right. and it looks like we have uh, two more questions that just came in so just let me know uh -huh. when you're ready and uh -huh. i'll read those out uh -huh. Just search them with Peter for Stan Klepko. It's very, it's very simple. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we have um, how are validations selected? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. So the, the, the validator business actually is very interesting business. So you guys probably know that 
uh, there are many, many validators now. Now almost everyone wants to be a validator. And it's a really great thing. The way the way I see validators in general, not just for labs, but validators are just like communities of people. They're like cooperatives and they kind of pull together. It's like small fish, making large fish out of small fish. So validators are like that and they're doing different blockchains and not only blockchains. I think it's the future. It's really, uh, they could do pretty much any as, anything as a network of validators. It's a cooperative. It's a scale level economic organization. So nowadays there are like small validators, medium validators, but also large validators. There are some validators who like venture financed and many, many of them. It's really great. I think that's really one of the greatest uh, trends of 2020 having these guys. I think currently the, the, the amount staked already is $7 billion and it's increasing. And it's really the model for the economy. I think people will be able to make money from this. No one can wait until Bitcoin is like 10,000. But everyone can work as a validator or to make some steady but reasonable return. So, so that's great. And so validators are interesting. I think what's going to end up is that all kind of brand networks are going to have the same validators because you know, validators are probably many cases that are geographically based, like you are like in the States, someone is in France. Okay, you have like friends in France. So you, you, you're local, so people stake with you. So validators, tend to be geographically split. So once you are in France and you're a validator, you will validate, you know, scale, you will validate Tezos, you will validate this and that. So all validators, OETH2, so all validators end up validating pretty much the same network. So your network is like totally dead, no one's validating it, or everyone is validating it. And because of that, two things. One thing which is gonna happen is that pretty much security is going to be the same because all of these guys are like the same. And the second thing is that the, the security of your network will be compound of all other networks. Like if someone validates scale and this guy or girl behaves badly, misbehaves, then she will destroy her reputation, not, not only with respect to scale, but also maybe ETH2 or Tezos. So the reputation will be like add, adding up and that's going to be great because smaller networks will be able to kind of piggyback on the reputation for big networks. So validators are going to be really great. And I think uh, they most of them will be secure because it's going to cost them a lot to actually lose their reputation. So this actually moves in a very good direction, I think. And uh, in our case, in scale, the way we do select validators, we just randomly select them. I think many other networks do the same. So we need like to have 100 validators. We basically randomly pick them out of our network uh, for, for this. Uh, for, for, and then we also rotate them. You can change the validator like once in a week, you can push one out, pull one in. Um, but I, th I think people sometimes misunderstand the insecurity of validators. Most of them are secure and the insecurity of blockchain networks mostly comes from un anonymous users, some from, from outside trying to hack. That's where the really has to be secure. But with respect to validators, things are doing pretty well. Even like if you look at like EOS or some other networks, almost no validators did bad things. All right, thank you. Um, what are the best industry use cases for BLS rollups? What situations are they most suitable for? I think uh, money transfers. Uh, I think the, uh, because it's a technology which actually the technology is based on the fact that it's cheap to post, post simple transactions to the main net. So if your transaction is simple, it's now getting cheaper to post it. So BLS is using this stuff. But if your transaction is utilizing lots of computation, there's no free lunch. So no, no BLS rollups can can help you. And so simple transactions. But I think uh, what we are going to see, so that the, we are going to see in this world for the most part is that the solution for all of our troubles is blockchain. So you can have all kinds of blockchain, fast, and they, they need to be connected. But once you have the blockchains, once you re replace it in this world, every server with a blockchain, then you can to take Facebook, you can take Google, you can really literally reproduce the internet infrastructure, but using blockchains and not servers and having the things um, and, uh, not centralized. So decentralized Uber won't charge, charge any fee. 
like I'm taking Uber and the drivers really don't like Uber because it takes 30% of their money. Well, the drivers also have to pay like for gas and repairing their car. So the 30% that Uber takes is actually more than 30% of their income. So people I think will really have decentralized Uber and uh, at some point decentralized Facebook. I actually did some poll on my Twitter and I asked what people want. Uber, Facebook, or Google, for whatever reason, people said they won't destroy Google. And I totally understand them. Google is really like bad company now. They they change their search results. You're not even able to identify paid from not paid links. So literally, they, they look the same. So people really don't like you, Google. And at some point, someone will create a decentralized Google. So, so I think it will start happening. Maybe uh, the next generation of people, like Generation Z, will do this because like for my generation it's an interesting problem but generation z they live they live in this space in the virtual space so problems they feel them much stronger and so something which will say okay facebook is okay they will say no i want decentralized facebook because that's my life or i want decentralized you know snapchat because my life is there i don't want it to be manipulated so i think blockchains will do this and then the uh, roll-ups will contribute uh, as, as niche solutions in some cases, in particular for payments. All right, thank you. Looks like we have question for one more question, time for one more question. Um, it says, if a user trans transacting with BLS rollups wanted their transaction history, do they look at operator storage in mainnet storage or operator storage only? Yes, that's a great question. So if, if they want, they can see what the operator posted the transactions that the operator posted on the on the mainnet so from this point of view the transaction history uh, will be on the mainnet because the operator is supposed to send every transaction to the mainnet on the other hand the internal operator history if if the operator sensors out someone and there's no log or trace of that so the operator will still be able to do some bad things Although in our case, we actually encrypt things, so it will be less interesting for operator to do bad things to some transactions because they encrypted the operator doesn't want to do to just why would the operator do it? Maybe the operator just doesn't like a particular user and starts censoring this user or slowing the user down. So we still have some problem like that. But in general, you're totally correct. You know, that's one of the problems with uh, rollups. Some of the information goes to the mainnet. But the history of transactions as the uh, operator accepted them, well, if the operator rejected, accepted, it's not there. And, and that, that's actually the centralized part. That's why rollup is not a blockchain. Rollup, rollups in general provide less uh, assurance and fairness than blockchains. Uh, uh, because in blockchain, you have multiple nodes and all of them uh, ideally contribute the same and not a single guy can, can do bad things. While if it's a single operator, you know, whatever ways you design to control here, still could be some problems. And one of the problems and this history get lost. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that thank was, you. looks like that was all of our questions for today. Um, I have placed you your guys. Twitter in the in mm -hmm. the chat box and, and thank you so much uh constantine for, for coming on and being a part of our ea education series um thank you for we the enjoyed you yes we, we definitely enjoyed having you um everyone um i hope you all have a great day we will be returning may 13th for another education series so join us then thank you bye bye, guys. bye, -bye.